In this little video, we'll talk about a number that is made up of other numbers that is still just a single number. Um, a little bit of history behind it. Uh, the imaginary number was stumbled upon by a guy named Cardano in the mid 1500s. Uh, he got it for a solution to a cubic. So some of you were probably given this example of, uh, well, it's a solution to x squared plus one is equal to zero. Because you have to find something that when you square it, you get negative one. And while that's true, it wasn't really how it came about originally. Uh, and so it was about 200 years later before Euler, uh, during his massive amount of writing and mathematics, decided to give it a name because it was just flat out easier than rewriting the square root of negative one each time. So he decided to give it the number i. And that's why we have it. Incidentally, Euler is also the one that gave us the number pi for the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter. Before that, they just referred to it as the ratio of a cir circle circumference to its diameter. It's kind of a, an awkward way of doing it, but hey, whatever, have at it. Um, so complex numbers are made up of the real numbers and the imaginary numbers, the ones including the i. And the structure of it is a plus b i, where a and b are real numbers. And it's sometimes referred to as components because they are in fact components to, um, to a vector in two space, in, in a plane, uh, called the complex plane. A is, a is the real component of that, and then bi is the imaginary component of that. And so some examples are like uh, four plus three, oh, well, four plus i, that'll work, four plus one i, uh, and then say negative three minus two i. We get kind of lazy and we don't say plus negative two i, we just say minus two i, even though we mean add negative two i. Uh, and then something as, as nasty, perhaps, as, say, 4 plus the square root of 2, and then plus negative 8 uh, minus the square root of 15, i. So the two components, 4 plus root 2, is the real component, and then the negative 8 minus root 15 is the imaginary component. And so it still, it still follows the structure, it just doesn't look very nice. But it doesn't have to, and that's the wonderful thing about it. We don't have to like the math that we get. We just have to know that it's true. <laughs> Sometimes it's just the way that it goes. I'm going to get some blowback on that from somebody. You're not supposed to say you don't like math. Well, sometimes you get an answer you don't like, but it's still true. It's, it's unfortunate. Uh, let's start with, with something easy like this, where we'll take this 4 plus i. And we'll add that to negative 3 minus 2i. Uh, when we do that, we just add these by components. It's almost identical to just combining like terms. And so you have the reals, and you combine them. So it's 4 plus negative 3 for a positive 1. And then you have the imaginaries. It's plus 1. And then I'm going to add a negative 2 to it for a negative 1i. And then traditionally, if it's a one in front of the variable, in this case it's not a variable, but however, it's a letter, we just simply write it as one minus i. And so be it, and that's it, that's the answer. So it's really not that bad. If you wanted to subtract them, and let me reverse the order on these, and then we'll go through some subtraction here. Uh, negative three minus two i, and then we're gonna go through subtracting four plus i is equal to. And now this negative sign has to get distributed through. So this is going to be negative 3 minus 4 for negative 7, negative 2 minus 1 for negative 3i. And that's what that would be. Easy peasy lemon squeezy. So now, well, what happens if we have radicals involved? Well, it's, it doesn't really change. It just means you can't combine like terms very easily. Uh, if we have something like uh, 4 minus, now I'm going to write this in a slightly different way and I'll explain why. i roots of 3. And then plus negative 7 root of 2 minus 4i. So you'll notice on the, on the back one, on this second complex number, I wrote the negative four first and then the i, like the, tradition, like, like the definition says. And then on the first, uh, the first set here, I wrote it as i roots of three. 
uh, there, there's actually really a reason behind it, although it's just a it's just a kind of a lazy person's way of doing it. However, when when people are writing this stuff down and they're writing it, not typing it, but writing it down, uh, they might be kind of sloppy, and they might do something like that when they mean the square root of three times i. But because the i looks like it could be under the root, it looks like it's the square root of i, and the square root of i is not a nice number. It actually involves pi strangely enough uh, but you don't want that I, I, I want this I want the square root of 3 times I and so to kind of alleviate that particular ambiguity we just throw the I in front and say I roots of 3 ta-da the end because my you know multiplication I can put it in any order life is good so that's the reason behind that uh, when you're however however when you're combining these you got to be extremely careful and notice that you know the stuff in the front the, the root 3 is technically in the front uh, but the stuff in the front is the stuff that's combined uh, so if I were to do this I take my 4 from the real component I add that to negative root 7 root 2 that's gonna give me 4 minus 7 roots 2 that's my real component plus and now I'm going to take the numbers, not the i, but the numbers. I have negative q, uh, root of 3 and then a negative 4. So I'm going to say minus 4 minus the square root of 3 in parentheses and then an i. And that is actually the answer. And that's all she wrote. So another way to do it, if you really wanted to, is you could pull the two negatives out and say minus and then the 4 plus root 3. That would also work. Either one. doesn't matter. As you're moving through this, just keep in mind, if you don't like it and you're just wondering what to do, put an X in place of I. And then when you're done, just replace I, X with I again. It doesn't really matter, but it just kind of makes you see, I've done this before. Now, adding and subtracting isn't too bad. Multiplication's really not that bad either. We're not gonna, we're not gonna go to division quite yet. Uh, but multiplication is not all that bad either. So if we take uh, let's say 2 plus 3i and we want to multiply that by negative um, 4 plus 6i. This is going to yield uh, something that we need to talk about just real quick but all we're going to do is we're just going to simply distribute this out. So that goes to here, that goes to here. It's almost like if you put x in the place of i you could just do the dirty four letter f word all over it and you know what? You could. And if you want to know what the dirty four letter F word is, um, you know, check out my other videos because I don't like it. It's dirty. So, <laughs> so 2 times a negative 4 is going to give me a negative 8. And then a 2 times a positive 6 is going to be, give me plus 12i. Then I have a positive 3i times a negative 4 is going to give me negative 12i. Well, isn't that interesting? I wonder why that happens. Uh, and then finally we have this three, pl uh, 3 times 6 which is plus 18 but then we have i times i it truly is i times i just like if you were to put an x there it becomes i squared so it, it looks a little weird because you have an i squared term uh, when you combine complex numbers either through mul uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, or division you are going to get another complex number back out. Real numbers are actually complex numbers that have a zero i component. So you can have a real number and say, oh, well, I got a real number. Yeah, but that's still technically a complex number. Real numbers are contained in the complex numbers. So here we have an i squared, which is not part of the complex number. Something must happen then. All right, well, let's take a look, see what does. Oh, let's pick a fun color here. Let's pick. Uh, yeah, let's pick green. So we take a look at these central terms and we know that we're adding 12i and we're subtracting 12i. Well, 12 minus 12, according to our rules up here, is 0. 0 times anything is just 0. There's no imaginary component coming out of there, so I'm left with this negative 8 plus 18i squared. So if we take a look at i again, it is i is equal to the square root of negative 1. If I were to square both sides, that would give me i squared, but then that gives me the square root of negative 1 squared. And up to this point, you should have learned that a function and its inverse k 
cancel one another out and you're left with the input. And so i squares is just simply negative one. So what I really have here in this negative eight plus 18 i squared is I really have negative eight plus 18 times negative one, which is negative eight minus 18, which is just negative 26. So all of this stuff, two plus three i times negative four plus six i all boil down to negative 26. Well, that's kind of cool or disturbing. I mean, it just depends on how you look at it. Uh, all of the rules of multiplication. And, and again, if you haven't gone through the, if you haven't gone through radicals by the time you hit I, um, I would suggest jumping back and taking a look at radicals first. Uh, working with I is not too bad, but it's typically introduced along with radicals because it is itself a radical. And so the same rules are going to apply most of the time. So what happens if we have to divide something? I'm going to change the numbers in this previous example ever so slightly. Uh, I'm going to have a 2 plus 3i on top and I'm going to divide that by negative 4 plus 5i on the bottom. You're like, well, how do you do that? Well, what you do is you don't end up actually dividing anything. At least it doesn't look like you do. But what you do do, I suppose, um, you take the complex conjugate, so you take a look at the sign in between the, the real and the imaginary components, and you flip it. So if it was a positive, you change it to a negative. If it was a negative, you change it to a positive. Negative 4 minus 5i. And we're going to repeat that to the top, keeping in mind that if we multiply the, the top and the bottom of any fraction by the same thing, we get an equivalent fraction. It just looks different. So, we're going to have to do these two multiplications. We're going to have to multiply 2 plus 3i by negative 4 minus 5i. If we do that, that's going to give us uh, negative 8, and then we have a negative 10i, and then a negative 12i, and then we have this negative 15i squared, which, if we combine all the like terms, I get negative 8. Now, this is going to be 15 to negative 15 times negative 1, just like it was up here. Negative 15 times negative 1 is a positive 15. Minus 8 is a 7. And then I have negative 10 and negative 12 for a negative 22i. All right, so that's the top. So let's take a look at the bottom and see what happens. Notice I'm not calling them numerator and denominator. I, I probably should, but top and bottom's good too. We'll, we'll just do that. So I can go ahead and make this my fraction bar here. That's going to give me negative 4 plus 5i and negative 4 minus 5i. If I distribute that, I get a negative 4 times negative 4 is a positive 16. Negative 4 times negative 5 is a positive 20i. Positive 5 times negative 4 is a negative 20i. And then I have a 5 and a negative 5 for negative 25i squared. And again, working it just like this that we did ab above this, we have these two th things are going to disappear. I don't have a yellow here, but I want a yellow. These two things are going to eliminate one another. And we're left with 16 minus 25i squared. Remember, the i squared is a negative 1. So this becomes really a plus 25. 16 plus 25 is 41. Our final answer is going to be 7 minus 22i over 41. OK, so now technically it's not in form. Uh, but normally when I'm teaching this for the first time, if students leave it like this, I'm okay with it. I, I don't, it's, it's not a preference necessarily, but I'm okay with it, it's fine. Uh, if you really wanna write it out properly, you really should write it out in the format, which is seven over 41, and then plus negative 22 over 41i. That's the proper way to do it. 
Um, again, I mean, it's, it's entirely up to the way that your instructor wants you to do it. But either one of these I would accept as the answer. Because it gets the point across. The, the, the whole idea of, of division is, do you know how to do the thing? Because if you know how to do the thing and you're demonstrating it, eh, that's, that's what I want. We'll, we'll talk about absolute rightness later, but that's pretty much division. Now the fun thing is if you're using a TI, uh, I'll see if I can bring it up real quick. But if you're using a TI 84, 83, and you're, and you're just working through these problems, as long as you're not dealing with radicals, it's not too bad. It'll actually do it for you. It's just a little bit weird. So let me drag this up here, see if I can make this come alive. So let's say I wanted to, I wanted to go ahead and do this particular problem. Well, I'm gonna put parentheses around it, and so this is gonna give me two plus three. Now my eye is actually, it's hard to see on, on this particular uh, emulator, but there's a blue eye down here above the decimal point. So I just press second key and then the decimal point to put the eye in there. And then I'm gonna to have to change something here in just a little bit because I forgot to do it in, uh, ahead of time. Divided by, and in parentheses, I'm gonna put negative. Remember that negative is below the three. It's not one of the operator buttons. Uh, negative four plus five. And then that second decimal point for the eye again. Now, in order to get the true answer out of here, I, I am going to have to go into my mode, and I'm going to have to go down to where it says real, and then a plus bi, and then r to the e or r times e to the theta i. I want a plus bi, so I pull down to it until it's flashing on top of it, and press enter. That selects it. Now I press second, and then mode again for quit. Now, when I go to do this problem, it'll actually put it back in the form uh, in form for me. If you scroll over, you'll see that you get a bunch of decimal points and then I at the end. Well, we're supposed to get a fraction. So if we go math and then change that thing to a fraction, then we'll get our answer back. So it can do some really cool things, but ultimately you still gotta know how to use the tool. Otherwise, the tool is useless. Uh, so speaking of the tool <laughs> and some of its uselessity, yeah, let's go with that. Um, we kind of have a, a kind of a neat thing, and I, I use this as a way to show my students that there are some cool things out there that kind of repeat themselves over and over and over and over. Um, if you recall a clock, and for those of us that are old enough to remember them, and sadly that's sometimes not everybody, but for those of us that are, that are old enough to remember a clock that has a face, every 12 hours, if it's a 12 hour clock, or 24 hours, if it's a 24 hour clock for all you military people out there, it repeats itself. Uh, in the case of the 12 hour clock, it repeats itself every 12 hours. And so you get one o'clock PM and one o'clock AM to distinguish between the two different cycles. Well, as it turns out, it has a periodicity of, of 12 hours. Um, the powers, the exponents, when you raise i to a power, actually behave somewhat the same way. If I were to take the value of i, i is, well, it's just i. So that's just i to the first. If I raise i to the second power, I get the square root of negative one squared, which is negative one. If I raise i to the third power, I can fake it and remember all of my different rules for multiplying uh, ex with exponents. And that's gonna give me i squared times i, which is just negative one times i, or negative i. i to the fourth is just i squared squared, which means this is just negative one squared, which is positive one i to the fifth can be thought of as i to the fourth times i. Well, i to the fourth was just one, so it's one times i, or just i. i to the sixth is i to the fourth times i squared. i squared is negative one times one is negative one. i to the seven is equal to i to the fourth times i cubed, which is just one times i cubed, and i cubed was negative i. And then finally, negative or i to the eighth is equal to 
i to the fourth squared, which is just one squared, which is just one. And you notice the same things are coming back each time. The same things are coming back each time. It's the same order. It's almost like it's going to repeat itself for always and forever. Strangely enough, it does. So let's say we wanted to find i to the 380th power. And we're like, oh, well, um, I guess I could go through this process until I hit 380. Uh, I could probably just throw out my calculator, right? So why don't we do that? Let's take i and let's raise it. Now, the other raise, the kind that actually uses the caret, to the 380th power and hit go. Wow, we got 1 minus something i. Okay. So apparently it's going to be 1 minus something i, but if you look, none of these are 1 minus anything i. Um, well, that's unique. Okay. Well, let's see if we can reason it out and then find out what, what's going on with the calculator. Because apparently the calculator's snotty. Or we're just wrong. One of the two. So uh, if, I, if I see this, it repeats itself every four. And if you notice, if I were to look at these powers as perhaps uh, a remainder. Hmm. So like if I were to take 5 and I divide it by 4, I get a remainder of 1, which i to the 5th looks like i to the 1st. If I take 6 and I divide it by 4, I get a remainder of 2, and that looks like i squared. If I divide 7 by 4, I get a remainder of 3, that looks like i cubed. If I have 8 and I divide it by 4, I get 2, and with no remainder. Anything raised to the 0 power is 1. Huh. All right. Um, I wonder... I, I wonder what 380 divided by 4 is. And the funny thing is, is we don't need to know. We actually just need to know, is there a remainder? And if there is, what is it? So we can look at this and say, well, our divisibility rules tell us that if we want to know if it's divisible by 4, we take a look at the last two digits and say, is 80 itself divisible by 4? And the answer is yes, which means that there's no remainder. So this is going to look like i to the fourth, which is just one. So my question to you, what's the difference? Why does your calculator give you something that is not one? And I'll leave that to you. Take a look at the numbers, see what it's saying, that sort of thing. Convince yourself that the calculator is actually wrong. Uh, you may have to go up into the 20s or the 30s as far as the exponents to actually find one that works, but uh, that forces it into this mode. But yeah, why is your calculator not agreeing with you and who's right? Trust me, it's not the calculator that's right. Shh, don't tell anybody. Now, uh, if, you, if this is all you were looking for, go ahead and stop here. Uh, you don't need to continue, but I am going to put just a smidge of an extension onto this. And this is to see which one of my students is paying attention. So we have equality, A plus B I. This is equality in complex numbers. So a plus bi is equal to c plus di. Two complex numbers are equal if and only if. This travels in both directions. So if you have one side, you have the other side. If and only if a is equal to c and b is equal to d. So if I want to show that two imaginary numbers are equal, I just have to simply show that the real components are equal and the imaginary components are equal. And that's good enough. So now here's we're going back all the way back to the very beginning of this video. And we talked about a guy named Euler. Now, Euler had a really fun number that he invented called E. And, and then he found out as he was working in complex algebra that if you take E and raise it to the I theta, theta is like a circle with a almost looks like a circle with a T inside. I'm gonna make that a little bit better. It's the Greek letter theta. It's typically used for angle measure. Uh, if you take e to the i theta, then you actually get cosine of theta 
plus i sine of theta. Oh, that's kind of cool. Well, this is an input sine and cosine are functions. So you can think of this as like x, which means that if I have e to the i 2 theta, I get cosine of 2 theta plus i sine of 2 theta, ah, the 2, 2 theta. But I can also rewrite this as e to the i theta squared, which means I have to take this cosine of theta plus i sine of theta, and I have to square it. When I do, one easy way to do this, by the way, is you square the first, so it's cosine squared theta. You square the second. Now, that, remember, that's i squared as well, so it's going to be a negative 1 times sine squared theta. And then you multiply the stuff inside, i sine theta, cosine theta, and you double it. So it's going to be plus 2i cosine theta sine theta. Now, keep in mind the way what I told you before as far as equality. This is the real component. This is the real component. So cosine of 2 theta is equal to the cosine squared of the angle minus the sine squared of the angle. Uh, well, huh, I wonder, I wonder what um, the sine of 2 theta is. If you're seeing this video and you've taken trig, uh, you, you know that you have to memorize a bunch of these. Like, it seems like a billion of them. They're called trig identities. You can build a lot of these using just Euler's formula. I don't memorize any of them. <laughs> so I'm a bad person, apparently. So yeah, I don't memorize these. I just derive them as I need it because I, I, don't, I don't see a purpose in memorizing a bunch of crap. So yeah. Anyway, just a little tidbit. I hope you liked the video. Take care.